Hi, this is National Master Dan Heisman, and we're here to give you another video, help you improve your chess game. Today we're going to talk about the initiative. I think everybody understands in general what the initiative is, but just in case, we'll talk a little bit about what it is. The initiative is where you're the one pushing the other person around the board. What does that mean? Usually that means you're the one who's making threats, and he's the one who's responding to threats. So when you have the initiative, you're the one who's trying to do things. He's the one who's trying to stop you. It's a little bit different than an attack. Attack, like for instance, if you're attacking a king, that means you're throwing all the pieces at his king and you're trying to checkmate him. Or if you're attacking the queen side, you might be trying to win material over there. The initiative is a little bit different. The initiative can start an attack, but the initiative is the part where you're just kind of pushing him back. You're making him respond to you. Before we show some examples, I'd like to give some of the ideas that would help you understand what would give you the initiative. The most common thing that gives you the initiative is when you're ahead in development, when your pieces are more active than his pieces. So for instance, in the opening, if your opponent wastes time moving the same pieces over and over, that usually gives you the initiative if you do it right and you get ahead of him in development. Another way of getting the initiative would be to have more material on one part of the board. Steinitz said that you can't attack where you don't have an advantage, and the corollary to that is that you should attack in areas where you do have the advantage. So, for instance, if the board is kind of cut off, if, if the center is kind of closed and you have more pieces on the king side and he has more pieces on the queen side, then you should attack on the king side, and hopefully if you do it well, you'll develop the initiative on the king side. Another way to get the initiative would be, for instance, to make a sacrifice to gain time. You could play a gambit in the opening, and you could gain time. We might look at something like that later. Another advantage that would give you the initiative would be if you have a, a positional advantage where you might be winning an endgame. Let's say you have a much better pawn structure, and if you go into an endgame, that those pawns are going to be really weak and you'll probably win. Then you have the advantage that if you trade pieces like trade queens and get toward that endgame, then that's good for you. So your opponent's going to try to avoid those trades. And when you offer those trades and he avoids them, you're, you're doing the old trader retreat idea, which is very good for the initiative because you're basically saying to the opponent, let's trade off. And he says, no, I can't. And then your pieces get further and further into good squares as he tries to avoid trades. So if he trades, it's good for you. And if he doesn't, it's good for you. He's between a rock and a hard place. And that gives you the initiative. Okay, let's look at a couple examples. I had a student play a game the other day, and I'm going to turn on the engine to show you what the engine says. Let's turn on Stockfish uh, 14 here. There's the PV, the top move. It says white in the initial position of the game is ahead by about 0.3, and he should play E4. All right, so in the game, my student played E4, his opponent played E5. My student played knight f3, the best move, and black played the Philidor defense, d6. Now my student is a fairly new student, and he doesn't know about looking up his openings after the game. And a lot of weaker players don't look up their openings in a book. If you watched the Queen's Gambit, you saw when Beth was studying to become a good player, she would lie in bed reading modern chess openings and, you know, going through the lines in her head and trying to learn her openings and look up gee, what did I do against the janitor that day? And next time he plays that, what should I play against him? And when I was a kid, I used to do the exact same thing. After every game, I would run to MCO and look up my openings and say, well, here's a book that tells you what a grandmaster would do in this position. Uh, you know, I did this, but next time I play someone, I'm going to do that. And it's a very important part of getting to be a better player is be willing to do that. And it's a lot of fun once you learn how to do it, and then it starts making your game better as you learn openings move by move. So here, if you do that with the Philidor, you'll learn that d4 is the move that gives you the most initiative. Why? Because black has a fairly solid center here, and unless you attack his e5 pawn with a pawn, you're not going to be open up, able to open up lines, and attacking it with other pieces doesn't help you. For instance, if you play b3 and he plays, let's say, bishop e7, and you play bishop b2, you're attacking the pawn twice, but he doesn't have to guard it anymore because it's guarded by a pawn and you're only attacking it with two different pieces. You need to attack it with a pawn in order to start to get some pressure. So in order to get the initiative against the Philidor defense, the best way to do that is to play d4 and keep white's initiative. And now you're threatening to take the pawn. And if he gives up that pawn, then white could nicely take with even with the queen or the knight. M more likely the knight, but you could take with the queen. 
And if you take with the knight, then you have a space advantage and his bishop is blocked. And when you start to work on things like that, you're more likely to keep the initiative. So in the game, my student played bishop c4, which is the second best move. Let's see what the evaluation does. Right now, Stockfish says white's up by about 0 0.85, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And if he plays bishop c4, it drops all the way down to about 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5 somewhere in that range. So he loses about half his advantage when you play bishop to c4. Very reasonable move. Hits that weak f7 square. It just doesn't provide that pressure against the center that you can get with d4. But again, that's why you look up the openings. And now his opponent should play something like knight f6 to here. A lot of weak players don't want to play knight f6 because of knight g5. But black can always maybe play d5 here and block the bishop. And you know, this is a little bit like a two knights defense where black's down the tempo here. Except that after pawn takes pawn, h6, there's no knight being hit on c6. So actually, there's some advantage to black not having that knight out. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Let's go back to the game. So in the game, black played bishop to e6. Let's turn off the engine for a second. Bishop e6. All right, so if I ask you here, what would you play for white? A lot of my lower rated students immediately say, well, I would play bishop takes e6 because I want to double his pawns. And that's true, you are doubling his pawns, but that pawn structure isn't very bad for black. Bishop takes e6, f takes e6. This extra pawn in the middle is very powerful guarding some important squares. And now when black castles kingside, he's got the only semi-open file on the board. And I could tell you a little principle, which is if you're playing a game of chess and the material's even, but you have the only semi-open file on the board. If you can put your rooks there, that's a pretty big advantage. So if we, if white could open up a whole bunch more lines, then having the, the semi-open F file for black wouldn't be a big deal. But now when you have the only semi-open file on the board, it's a pretty big deal. So those double pawns aren't that weak for black. Um, so bishop takes E6 to double his pawns isn't necessarily a great idea. What my student played in the game is he said, oh, my bishop is attacked, I need to save it. And he did what a lot of lower rated players do. He guarded it, but he didn't guard it in the best way. He guarded it with by playing b3, which blocks the bishop's retreat. And if we ask the stock, if we ask Stockfish what the top six or seven ways to save the bishop are, Mr. Stockfish, how would you save the bishop here? b3 right now is... Uh, well, I just dropped off the top six, so I need might need to go to seven or eight. All right, so b3 right now is hanging in there at number seven, and now it's up to number six. So it's not one of the better ways to save the bishop. But now you might notice the best move is bishop takes e6, and you go, aha, Dan, bishop e6. You told me that bishop e6 wasn't that good. The double pawns weren't that good. Well... This video is about the initiative, and that's what bishop takes e6 is about. It's true that bishop takes e6 doubles the pawns, and those double pawns aren't that weak. But there's a really, really good reason for playing bishop takes e6 here. And it has nothing, I shouldn't say it has nothing, it has less, less to do with the doubling of those pawns. The reason that bishop takes e6 is a good move is if you play a move like b3 and just save the bishop, that move doesn't do that much. It, it, it might help you fianchetto the bishop, but as we already saw, fianchettoing the bishop against the e-pawn doesn't work very well unless you play d4 anyway. So the time you get to play b3 to develop the bishop isn't all that helpful. But now black can do anything he wants. And you're not threatening him. You have no initiative. So black could, for instance, develop the knight and attack the e-pawn, or Stockfish says black can play bishop e7 with equality here. Notice, if black was that worried about double pawns, then Stockfish would not play bishop e7 here. Stockfish would double white's pawns. He would say, oh, you don't want to double my pawns? I'll double your pawns. But you could see here, doubling white's pawns and bringing another white pawn to the center is also not the best move. So neither side should double the pawns in this position. If, if you still think that double pawns are always bad, studying stuff like this is very helpful. All right, so bishop e7 is black's best move, and black is close to equality now. But after bishop takes e6... The idea isn't necessarily to double his pawns. The idea is to make him spend a tempo recapturing so that now white can do anything he wants. And Stockfish says what he wants to do here 
you start to set up a big center with maybe c3 followed by maybe queen b3 hitting the b pawn and the e pawn and forcing black to defend or maybe d4 getting a good center with more space it says if black counterattacks the e pawn white should ignore it and hit these two pawns black should play queen c8 see notice how white's the one making the threats and black's the one responding and now white just castles and white has a good game about 0.9 here because black's queen is a little awkwardly placed he has to guard the the two pawns so white has the initiative in this position is it a big initiative is it a big attack no of course not all right let's look at a game that i played against the computer that i did out loud here on my youtube channel but most people haven't seen those games so let's look at just the opening of that game it's number 40 in my history so let me go ex40 and bring it up all right so i was white against the mid-level engine beth o and let's see how i got and maintained the initiative in this opening all right well we'll, we'll make the board bigger here for you okay so i played e4 he played e5 i played knight f3 he plays d5 which some people call the elephant gambit i guess I, I guess the elephant gambit could be this move or it could be on the next move when you don't take the pawn back but anyway in the old days we used to call this the queen pawn counter gambit so i took the pawn and now the main line is for black to play here and white to play queen to e2 followed by d3 probably picking up a pawn but instead, Beth O plays the inferior move, queen takes d5. Well, the queen's on a great square on d5. He just wishes he could stay there. And, of course, the queen can't stay there because I can AWL the queen. And if you AWL the queen while you're developing your pieces, we call that winning a tempo. If you haven't seen my recent video on winning tempos. So I have a video on AWL. I have a video on winning tempos. This is going to be both an AWL and a winning a tempo. AWL is always well defined. Anytime you attack something with something worth less, it's AWL. Winning a tempo is more subjective, but it usually means in the opening, if you AWL something and you're, you're getting a piece more active and he has to take a piece that he would normally like to leave where it is and move to another square where he's no, not more active, then you're winning a tempo. So here the queen's on a very good square, but it's bad. the only reason it's a bad square is because it's vulnerable and he has to move the queen he probably should move the queen to a5 where i can't get to it he plays the queen to a5 okay so now how does white maintain the initiative well a lot of my students in this kind of position they play bishop c4 and then after knight f6 they play d3 because they're worried about here and then after black plays something like let's say knight c6 or Maybe let's say bishop e7 to answer knight g5 with castles. And then they castle and they castle and then they bring their bishop out. And you know, white's better here, there's no doubt. But in my game, I realized, okay, if I'm ahead in development, then I want to blast open the position because it gives me the best chance for the initiative. So I play d4, which is a much better way to play the position. I'm blasting open the center where I'm going to be able to castle faster than he can and I have more pieces out than he does. And of course, Beth O, being a mid-level engine and not a, you know, really strong engine, plays it wrong. Beth O pushes the pawn and hits my knight. All right, so now I have to move the knight again. If I don't, he has a tactic. He can win my knight for a pawn. He AWL'd my knight. So I can't follow, I, I can follow the principle, move every piece once before you move any piece twice unless there's a tactic. Because here, if I don't move the knight, he's got a basic counting tactic. So I have to move the knight, and I do move at the e5. And now I have a double idea. I can play bishop c4 and attack that weak f7 square. Or I can play knight c4 and start chasing his queen around the board, depending on what he does. He plays bishop to e6. Well, now I don't want to play bishop c4 because I'll just be trading the bishop. But in some lines, I love to play d5 and make this bishop move again. I have to watch out for my knight starting to hang when I do that. So what I play is I play knight c4 first before I play d5. Now he's between a rock and a hard place. I'm threatening his queen again. If he moves the queen, then the queen won't be in a strong position, and there's not a lot of great places to move it. If he takes the knight, I'll win the bishop pair, and I'll gain more development because I'll trade a piece that he's moved twice to help me bring out a piece that I haven't moved yet. So that'll help my development. So he plays queen to b4, hitting my knight twice. 
All right, what's the best way to save the knight? Well, I can't guard it with b3. That would hang my knight on c3. That would be a disaster. I can move the knight, but I just moved it there. I could play queen to e2 to guard the knight, but then he could trade everything off, and my initiative wouldn't be good for much. So what I did was I said, let me attack the queen first and play a3. Now he can't play queen c4 because he would lose the queen for two pieces, but there's nowhere he can go where his queen will continue to attack my knight on c4, and therefore my knight on c4 is now perfectly safe. So I do this, uh, this further AWL, which does, this doesn't really win a tempo because the pawn on a3 is not a developing move, but it does save the knight and it pushes the queen back to bad squares. So he puts the queen on e7, but now that blocks the bishop from coming out, which makes it harder for him to castle. So I play my move d5, the move I told you about, and that gives me another square for my queen here, which would attack the pawn. It also gives me the possibility of playing the pawn to d6 in some lines and threatening the queen and the pawn. All I need is maybe a bishop on, on f4 and a knight on b5. Meanwhile, he's got to take time and move the bishop. So he moves the bishop all the way back to where he started from. Now you can see I've got two knights out. I've got a better center pawn, and I've got my pieces out. So now I want to keep attacking those squares. So I play bishop f4, in some lines threatening d6, and other lines threatening knight b5, followed by knight takes c7 or d6. The engine plays bishop f5, moving the bishop again, overprotecting his e-pawn. And now I have a pleasant choice between moves like d6 or knight b5. I play d6. If he takes, I take with the knight, forking his king and his bishop. But if he moves the queen, then I can just take this pawn on c7, or I could look for an even better move. So he plays queen h4 and hits my bishop. Okay, well... I could take the pawn on c7, and if he takes the bishop, I could take the knight with check, but then I'm only winning a pawn, and I'm out for bigger fish now. So I want to save the bishop and get time. So I have a choice between bishop g3 or g3, whichever one gets me the most, and I think I chose g3. All right, that makes the pawns weak around the king side if I ever castle there, but I don't think it's going to get that far. Right now, he doesn't have a lot of places to put his queen that are safe. So let's see what he does. He plays queen f6. All right, but now I can bring my knight up and attack this pawn again and his queen. So I have a tremendous initiative. In fact, my initiative is so great now that I have a winning attack. So I do play knight to d5. Notice he can't take my b-pawn. My knight on c4 is guarding it. His queen is running out of squares. He plays queen to g6. Okay, well now I'm looking at maybe trapping the queen with moves like knight to e5 already. Or I could play knight check first and then play knight to e5. I'm just winning anyway. Knight takes check. King d8. And now this rook's not going anywhere. I could take the rook and win the game easily, no problem. You know, when you see a good move, look for a better one. If you don't see a better one, absolutely take the rook. I play knight e5. I'm doing all these AWL moves to keep a tremendous initiative. And now where does he put the queen? Well, if he puts it on h5, I take it with the queen. If he puts it on g4, I take it with the knight. If he puts it on h6, I take it with the bishop. He plays queen f6. All right, white to play. This is a... Uh, Interesting position. Pause the video. Tell me what you would play. All right. So what I played is bishop to g5, pinning the queen to the king. If you looked at that move and you said, I can't do that because my bishop would be hanging, then that's a quiescence error. We'd love to play bishop to g5, but if it's hanging, what good is it? Well, the answer is it's, it's a pin followed by a, an attraction move. I'm attracting the queen to the g5 square. And when he goes there, I get a fork and I win the queen. So I'm giving up the bishop and then I get a pawn and a queen for it. So he moves the king over, I take the queen, and of course, Betho doesn't resign, so I won the game easily. All right, let's look at one further example of initiative. We'll look at what uh, Eliekin did in a game. All right, let's go to, um, uh, this is from Eliekin's best games book. And I'm gonna turn on the engine on the bottom here 
So we can see the engine telling you what's happening with the evaluation in this game. We're not going to look at the whole game. We're going to look at the most, well, we'll look at most of the game. It's a game played in the Moscow Championship in 1919. Alyekin was white against a player named Isakov. All right, so Alyekin played e4, e5, d4. Center game, Mr. Stockfish, what do you think? Stockfish says, take that pawn. Takes the pawn. Stockfish says, I would play knight f3 with equality. Alyekin says, I'm going to play a... Like Goring Gambit. All right, so pawn there. And now the best move for black is queen e7. I once played a game against Lou Golder in the Philadelphia Championship, Philadelphia Invitational Championship, where I did play this move, and Lou played queen e7 against me, and I was unhappy. All right, so black plays pawn takes pawn, which Stockfish says is just about as good. And Eliakin gives knight takes an exclamation point. He says the Danish Gambit with bishop c4, not so good. So knight takes c3. Let's go through the opening relatively quickly here. Black pins it with bishop to b4. White plays bishop c4. Notice what is what is Elyekin trying to do? He's trying to gain the initiative by sacrificing a pawn. And of course, he's going to be ahead in development because of that. Black just plays d6. Stockfish hates that move and says already white could play bishop takes f7 check, king takes f7 check, Queen b3 check and win his, piece, his pawn back with advantage. Now in the book, Alyekin saw that, of course, and he said that it was no good for him to do this. So let's see why Alyekin was wrong. It's always fun with these old books to see why he's wrong. He says after bishop takes, pawn takes, queen checks, bishop e6, queen takes b4, black could play knight c6, and he says if queen takes pawn... Black would play knight to d4 with a good game. But Stockfish says, Mr. Elyekin, I will play here. And if Black tries this knight d4 stuff, I will play this check. And if he hits my queen here, I'll just move my queen back to d1 and hit your knight. And let's say he plays something like, I don't know, queen f6 to save the knight. Bishop e3. And now, let's say he, I don't know, Stockfish says c5, knight g2, knight takes, queen takes. Stockfish has white ahead by four pawns here. Wow, that's a lot. My evaluation wouldn't be that white's up by four pawns, but white is better. Black's king is going to be a little awkward for the rest of the game. And black's queen side is a little vulnerable. Maybe queen to b5 can come up after white castles. All right, let's go back to the game. So... Elyekin was wrong in his notes, but that happens in these old books. Now that we have computers, we can find errors in all the old books like that. All right, so d6. Knight's white plays knight to f3. Stockfish says, oh, you're back to about equal now. Bishop takes check. Pawn takes. Now white has the bishop pair. Knight to c6. Castle. Computer still says black's a little better. Knight f6, best move. Bishop to a3, hoping to get e5 in and open up the diagonal. So, so the engine says black should play bishop g4 with a big advantage. Black plays castles. Stockfish says, aha, castles. Normally you want to castle as fast as you can, but here it lets white play e5 because the pawn's pinned. Alyakin plays e5. Now Alyakin's getting the initiative back. Knight to g4. Pawn takes pawn. Pawn takes pawn. Stockfish says, I can win this pawn back later. He wants to play rook e1. Alyakin gets his pawn back with bishop takes. Rook e8. And Alyakin gives rook e1 and gives it exclamation point. And, and the engine agrees. Rook e1 is the best move. White's bishop pair... And the fact that they're all pointing to the king's side here gives white some initiative here, besides a very small advantage in material but by having the half a pawn for the bishop pair. Okay, so rook e1. Black should play rook takes e1 check. He plays bishop f5. Now the engine says bishop takes f7 check works again. This time Elyekin does it. Bishop takes check. So 
What's Hayekin doing here for the initiative? Well, he's going to give up the bishop, and he's going to make black very awkward, and he's going to expose his king for a long time. So bishop takes. He has to take it. If he doesn't, you get a pawn in the rook. And after king takes, he checks. And now bishop e6 loses a piece to knight to g5 check. If he takes with the queen, you take with the queen and save your queen and win his. And if he doesn't, then the king has to move, and then you get to win the bishop for nothing. So he can't put the bishop in the way. If he puts the rook in the way, we take the bishop with check. If he plays king here, we play, uh, let's say, is it knight? Rook, oh, rook takes rook to deflect the queen. And when the queen goes off of the h4 square, we play knight checks, which hits the bishop twice, and we win the bishop. So for all those reasons, black has to play king f6. It's the only move that saves everything right away. And now white has a good initiative. He's got a lot of pieces around the black king. The black king's stuck without uh, a lot of pawn cover. And white's just going to have a lot of threats in the next few moves. Let's see what his next move was. He plays h3. Engine says best move. White's up by 1.9. 1, 1. Now... The engine says black should sack the piece back with here. Black understandably doesn't want to do that. He plays bishop e6, attacking the, the queen. Here, the engine says you could sack the exchange here. Rook takes e6, rook takes e6, queen g5 check, king f7, queen f5 check. The bishop's hanging, so you have to be careful. Queen f6, knight g5 check, and white's up by five pawns. So again, you know, Eliakin misses this, but the engines are perfect with these kind of attacks. So, so Eliakin plays queen d2, gives it an exclamation point. Of course, white's still winning, but it's not as strong as the line the computer found, of course. Knight to h6, he has nothing better. And now the engine says Eliakin should play queen f4 check. Eliakin plays g4, threatening the fork. Of course, that's still winning too. Now he gives black's response g6 as an exclamation point. Best try. Engine says king g6. And then white would play the obvious rook and a to b1. Hitting this pawn, getting the rook in the game, and maybe going for a rook lift to come across. In the game, after g4, black played g6. White play. Now the engine here says knight g5 is the best move. Eliakin says also strong would be queen takes knight. He doesn't consider knight knight to g5. He plays g5 check to get his piece back. Of course, that wins easily. Why not? King f7. We could play the rest of the moves and call it a day. Let's see here. How much more did the game go? Only about 10 moves. All right, very quickly, the game finished. G takes h6. Queen f6. Knight to g5 check. King to g8, f4, rook a d8, rook a d1, bishop c4, bishop e7. Is that the best move? Stockfish says you should just play a3. Bishop e7 trading everything off to a winning endgame. Rook takes d2, bishop takes f6. The two rooks guard each other. Rook takes check. Rook takes. And now there's mating threats down here. So black plays uh, bishop to f7. Knight e4, best move. Rook takes pawn. Bishop g7, clearing the way for the knight with a mating attack. Bishop to b3, knight checks, king f7, and just knight takes h7, and Eliakin won. Okay, so we've looked at the idea of the initiative today. We looked at an amateur game where taking the piece made him recapture and kept the initiative. We looked at my game against the engine, where the engine let me keep doing AWL moves, which gave me a big initiative. And now we looked at a grandmaster game. Maybe Black wasn't a grandmaster, but a high-level game from the Moscow Championship where Alyekin used sacrifices. First, he sacrificed a pawn in the opening, and then he sacrificed a piece later.
to get a, a strong attack and get the initiative. Alyekin's a good player to study. Alyekin and Kasparov are great initiative players. So they're really good ones to study their games. Of course, there's other good players. Fisher's very good with the initiative. Every world champion is, really. But certain ones are more attacking than others. You know, Boris Spassky. Probably not Petrosian as much. But you should see those games Petrosian played against the, the weak GMs and the IMs. He was, he, he was pretty good with the initiative in those games. He just didn't like to do it as much against the top players. He, he went for equality. Okay, so this is Dan Heisman. Please tell your friends about our channel. And you can subscribe, you can like the video, and we'll see you next time. Bye.